the evolution of uh, treatment strategies for uh, peritoneal metastases uh, becomes a regular part of the meeting, not just an isolated uh, uh, event uh, engineered, I guess, by you uh, uh, for this uh, meeting. I think we have uh, in this room here the heavy hitters in uh, surgical oncology. And uh, thank you uh, very much for, uh, for coming. Let's just see if I'm... Can you bring me up here? Can the projectionist, can you help me a minute? Just bring it up. I'm not quite sure. So, what I'd like to do, uh, bring up the, uh, the checklist. What I'd like to do is start with a, an introduction, and I'm going to just uh, um, make a few more comments, uh, Wahid, about where we are at this point in time uh, with uh, uh, cytoreductive surgery. Um, it's a very humbling uh, experience to uh, try in, uh, an hour or an hour and 15 minutes to uh, to tell you about uh, all the various aspects of peritoneal uh, metastases. And so uh, distributed around the room are some uh, pens which uh, tell you how to get to um, www.psogi2016.com because we need at least 20. Uh, Egyptian uh, surgeons interested in uh, the total treatment. For me, the total treatment of ovarian uh, malignancy and the total treatment of gastrointestinal cancer is dependent on the availability of uh, high tech. And there's a lot of questions, high tech, epic installations. I think for right now, <coughs> It should be CRS and high tech, and, and we can evolve to other treatments, but the safe thing uh, for initiation of this at your hospitals is CRS first, and then high tech. I have no conflicts. So, You know, this is, this is not the first uh, speech. Can, we, can you give me some help here? Somehow or other, we got up uh, this. This is not the right one. Let's go to. Uh, So the, the, the first presentation here is uh, side reductive surgery in high pack who, what, when, where, why, and how. We will do this very quickly. And then I'd like to show a video that illustrates the peritoneectomy procedures because Wahid, I agree with you. This this is this is better. Thank you. Right. Okay. who have liver metastases and peritoneal metastases, but that's not the place to start. 
we're, we're looking for people with isolated peritoneal metastasis. Now, what he, you, you emphasize this, it's not so simple. <coughs> there are uh, four major diseases that we're uh, interested in. These unusual applications of cytoreductive surgery in high tech urachal adenocarcinoma. The day before I left, I did a adrenal adenocarcinoma with peritoneal metastases, uh, endocervical mucinous tumor with peritoneal metastases. So there's a lot of unusual, unusual indications. Unusual indications for CRS and HIPEC. We've got the prevention protocols coming along, treatment protocols. And then uh, maybe after a while we could talk about some of the extreme treatment protocols with the three hours of uh, hyperthermia and the uh, use of the nanoparticles and that sort of thing. Which uh, So, what is it? combination of cytoreductive surgery using peritoneectomy and visceral resections and then perioperative chemotherapy and yes, cure is the goal in order for cure to be the goal we need this surgical complete response and um, we don't want to use it there's something there's something uh, um, almost uh, 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 magical or something about this PCI. And I, I must say, I don't understand it. But you, you really want to, in this disease as in any other malignancy, you want to take on patients with a low volume of, uh, of cancer. And when we have, uh, you all know how to use this PCI, uh, there's 13 abdominal pelvic regions and the volume of tumor, the lesion size is scored in each, um, it estimates the likelihood of a complete side of reduction, and it certainly estimates uh, the, the survival. So, when, when patients have low volume disease, when you would like to do this as the first major surgery. I would say, you know, most of the big league complications and the very, very long surgeries are in patients who've been operated on one or two or three, this uh, adrenal cortical adenocarcinoma I did the other day, she had three prior surgeries. So we spent the first uh, two and a half to three hours just kind of sorting out the abdomen. And that's where you get the fistulas. So we have this prior surgical score, and uh, it really does work. Uh, the more prior surgeries patients have, the poorer they do. And... Uh, a prior surgery score of one is just a you know an exploratory laparotomy. Two resection of two to five abdominal pelvic regions, and three, of course, a prior. Because this is what happens. This is what happens after major surgery. You you do get this tumor cell entrapment. The the fibrous adhesions that are left behind are loaded with cancer, and intraperitoneal chemo is not going to do anything. With, with cancer cells in fibrous tissue. And by the way, systemic chemotherapy is going to do very little also. So you'd like to get these patients, the when is you'd like to get them first with a small volume of disease. The essential components of the treatment of peritoneal metastases occur in, uh, at this point in time, occur in the operating theater. This is not neoadjuvant chemotherapy although I'm all for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it's not adjuvant chemotherapy. This is new. This is a new way of, of uh, approaching the problem of uh, intra-abdominal cancer. This is perioperative chemotherapy. It's not something your medical oncologist learned when he was uh, in his uh, training. So there's a big educational effort of the medical oncologist uh, as well as your hospital administration. Um, why do the cytoreductive surgery? Uh, because you're not going to have a cure without a complete cytoreduction. And uh, this completeness of cytoreduction score is something uh, uh, that uh, is necessary 
You know, for pseudomyxoma peritonei, you can leave a little bit of tumor behind and, and, and get a good result because uh, in some respects, the CC score is dependent on the invasive nature of the disease. If you're dealing with gastric cancer and you leave even the most minute quantity behind, you're not going to fail, even colorectal. Ovarian is very interesting. Ovarian is very interesting. And mesothelioma is very interesting. In our work with ovarian and with, with uh, peritoneal mesothelioma, we do see cures with HIPEC, with CC2 cytoreductions. reductions. And as a matter of fact, when we look at the data on a large number, several hundred mesothelioma patients, the survival with the CC2 cytoreductions reductions plus HIPEC is the same as the CC0 and ones. So there are some diseases where this rule, like colorectal and gastric, that you must remove the every last visible component of the disease in order to achieve success is not universal. Okay, now the complexity. We have got a lot of drugs. And um, there's some that are better than others. There's no doubt about it. Um, for me, there's a miracle drug here, intraperitoneal paclitaxel, not so often used, but uh, the area under the curve ratio is a thousand, so you have a thousand times the concentration or exposure of the drug to peritoneal surfaces after in intraperitoneal installation as you would if you gave it systemically. A thousand times. Doxorubicin is a pretty good drug also, but it also has these sclerotic effects, so you have to be uh, very uh, careful. Um, I use a lot of melphalan. Um, it's been used for liver perfusion and uh, for uh, uh, limb perfusion, and it also is good for peritoneal perfusion. So um, a lot of work yet needs to be done to optimize the intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Why use heat? Well, there's a whole variety of reasons to use heat, but I'm not going to uh, go through those because you're basically familiar with the fact that many different chemotherapies, especially the ones that we listed, are augmented times 2, times 10, times 100 by 42 degrees as compared to uh, uh, 37 degrees. Um, why? Well, you know, I couldn't say this uh, um, a number of years ago, but I, I can say that right now, one of the main reasons why you should, in your multidisciplinary <coughs> team, discuss the use of uh, cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC is that it's the standard of care. This is the, the standard of care in Europe, with the exclusion of Greece, for colorectal peritoneal metastases is cytoreductive surgery and hot bed. And certainly for appendiceal and, and for uh, uh, mesothelioma, it's a standard of care. Now, we're here at an ovarian cancer meeting, and is it the standard of care for ovarian? No, it is not as yet a standard of care, but it's very reasonable to use it there is a single randomized controlled study. Uh, I think it's a good study. Some people say it's no good. I don't know why they say it's no good. Uh, that comes out of Greece that shows a real survival advantage. Okay? It's, it's complex surgery. It's not for, uh, you know, someone fresh out of uh, their surgical uh, training. But we've got the peritoneectomy procedures and the visceral resections and and uh, I'm going to show a video in just a minute, I hope, that is going to uh, demonstrate the uh, peritoneectomy procedures. So we have a patient in the lithotomy position. I use this uh, um, Valley Lab uh, extended ball tip on very high voltage for the dissection. And you just lay this ball tip at the interface of the peritoneum and uh, the, uh, say here, the posterior rectus sheath. And, and it, it, the ball tip almost does it uh, uh, on its own. 
Um, I use a retraction system that keeps the abdomen and pelvis exposed at all times. And we don't have to put retractors in and, and find exposure down in the left lower quadrant and then put another set of retractors in to... It, the thing is exposed all the time, and so you can do what I call centripetal surgery. And centripetal surgery means you keep going around and around the abdomen. If you're dissecting in an area that... that uh, you're fearful of some damage to vital structures or bleeding, stop. Go somewhere else. Go around and around and around and keep the procedure very safe. Uh, because uh, I know that you know that the major reason for uh, uh, inoperability is, is a major problem early on in the uh, dissection. And you get discouraged and uh, decide, oh, well, this is an open and closed procedure. Stripping down of the... Uh, Hemidiaphragms, extremely important in ovarian malignancy. I must say, in most ovarian cancer cases, you don't just strip the right hemidiaphragm. You have to strip and then resect the tendinous mid-portion of the hemidiaphragm. So just don't, don't, uh, don't be excited when you uh, have to go through and into the pleural space. And uh, don't, don't feel that now you're disseminating the disease from the abdomen to the chest because uh, the high tech is done with the uh, diaphragm open and uh, before we had the open high tech we had a huge number of patients who recurred in the peritoneal space I mean they recurred in the pleural space we don't have it anymore because we washed both body cavities so don't worry about uh, uh, going as a matter of fact when we get a small hole in the diaphragm which is very common we then make a large hole we take out the tendinous mid-portion and make sure that we wash the chest, the pleural space, as well as the peritoneal space. Tripping the right handy diaphragm, the greater omentectomy, and, uh, you know, if you're, if you're really uh, 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 careful, you can preserve this uh, anterior branch of the uh, inferior phrenic uh, artery and vein. Now, sometimes separating the men from the boys or the girls from the women inside of reductive surgery is the lesser omentectomy procedure and omental bursectomy. And I used to do a lot of gastrectomies because of this disease up in the uh, lesser omental tissue. But uh, uh, very strong digital dissection can move the tumor and the fatty tissues off of this arcade made up by the left and right gastric arteries and thereby preserve the, uh, the stomach. And you don't need to do a pyloroplasty or a gastrogenostomy if you sacrifice the anterior vagus. Okay, you just, you don't need to. I used to do it all the time, but I, I, you just don't need to. And then you get down underneath and you strip the uh, floor of the omental bursa. Now, I hope to show you that in the video, and then you clean this uh, whole area out. And then we we'll come to the pelvic peritoneectomy, usually with an en bloc resection of the pelvic peritoneum, the uterus and ovaries, sometimes the seminal vesicles uh, in a male if the disease uh, penetrates uh, down through the rectal vesicle space into the seminal vesicles. Um, and um, then we come to, this is uh, one of the, the high techs that, uh, that I, I use. This is a closed uh, technique uh, through a laparoscopy port. If your nurses and the like are worried about the aerosols, you can do it that way. There is the open and the closed techniques. I don't think I can speak uh, to any real difference between the two, except the open technique is much more convenient. Now, this is too complicated for me to present here, but this is our standardized orders. So you should, before you start, set up a standardized orders, clear it with your pharmacy, so when you're in the operating room, 
and you want to use, say, mitomycin C, doxorubicin, and, and systemic chlorouracil, which is our standard to care for colorectal, it just happens. Or if you've got a gastric and ovarian cancer, you're using cisplatinum, uh, doxorubicin, and systemic ifostamide. So you see, my, my regimens are, are uh, almost always double or triple drug regimens. Some of the drug goes in intraperineally, some of the drug goes in uh, um, intravenously. Melphalan is what we use for all the recurrences, and then for gut tumors, they would get to resection and intraperitoneal gemsar. So we talked uh, before a little bit about HIPEC, and in HIPEC you use the heat <coughs> augmented drugs, and then EPIC, early postoperative interperitoneal, you need to use those drugs that are not augmented by heat but are cell cycle specific. And the most important one is paclitaxel. Paclitaxel is uh, probably your most effective agent <coughs> in working with intraperitoneal paclitaxel in working with ovarian malignancy. So it is more complicated than you might think. We've got NIPS, the neoadjuvant intraperitoneal and systemic chemotherapy. We've got HIPEC, we've got EPIC, and then we're now using a lot of BANK, the bidirectional adjuvant normothermic chemotherapy. Conclusions. Who? Patients with isolated peritoneal metastases. What? It's a potentially curative treatment of a previously <coughs> terminal condition. When? As soon as the diagnosis of peritoneal metastases is made, I tell you, I think one of the most common mistakes, yes, mistakes that's made in the management of cancer patients today is uh, to uh, take a patient who has peritoneal uh, seeding, say, from colorectal cancer, and right now, most places in the world, the surgeon refers that patient to the medical oncologist. <coughs> And the medical oncologist gives them systemic chemotherapy, and every four months he does a CT scan, and oh, you're doing fine, uh, the tumor markers are stable, the CT scan is stable, it keeps giving the chemotherapy, and then 18 months later, you get a call from the medical oncologist. Ah, patient's obstructed, throwing up. Um, they've been treated for a year and a half and under observation. That's not the way to manage these patients. They, they need to, to, to uh, uh, have an aggressive approach, and your radiologic studies are not adequate in order to monitor, and patient symptoms are not adequate in order to monitor what's going on inside the peritoneal space. Where are the treatments in the operating room? Why? Because standard of care is not systemic chemotherapy alone. Let me say that again. Standard of care in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, it's, it's not the standard of care. The multidisciplinary team needs to focus on these patients with peritoneal metastases and get them to a, an established referral center. And then how do you do it with CRS and HITECH? Now, could I go to the video now, Mr. Projectionist? The uh, video presentation. You you need it from me. Let me just get Are there questions at this point in time that uh, we want to? What's that? It's all intraperitoneal. All intravenous. Paclitaxel is intraperitoneal drug for me. Postoperatively. Postoperatively. <laughs> yes. Uh, published uh, data: 20 milligrams per meter squared in one liter of uh, peritoneal dialysis fluid, five days in a row. Spectacular results in my experience. Non-randomized studies. <laughs> yes. We put it into a Tinkoff cap. But you can put it into any chapter you want. And it just goes in. It dwells for 23 hours. The nurses drain out what's left. You put in another installation. 
Yes. In your papers, you mentioned that it's uh, that you, with, uh, during the dissection, you use the <coughs> tip. You yes. use it on pure cut. The uh, ball here, tip yeah. is used on pure cut. Why? Because here everyone uses why. Okay, I'm going to show you. Okay. Um, the dissection is with uh, maximal traction, counter traction. <coughs> the ball tip, I use the uh, Valley Lab, it's called the Triad. 300. Force. Triad. Force? Force Triad. Force Triad. 300. And then there's no bleeding. Okay, you take these, uh, the, you know, the perineum is, is quite uh, a, a rich vasculature. So you take these uh, surfaces down and there's no bleeding. With the cut, not the coag. Pure cut. Because if you use the coag, it kind of sticks there and you don't have a nice, uh, a nice uh, surface. Yes? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. And I think uh, it's a political question and all politics are local. So at the Washington Hospital Center, I am responsible for the dose of chemotherapy and the choice of drugs. And uh, that's the easiest and best way to do it because I have a lot of experience with it. Now, as you start up a new program, I think you need to uh, use the uh, medical oncologist to keep yourself out of trouble. So if there is a problem, you can say, okay, Dr. Medical Oncologist ordered up this dose of drug uh, for this duration, and uh, so I, I think it needs to be a cooperative effort. Yes? Yeah, so, so I'm a medical oncologist. Yes. Uh, in London, and I also run a... It's okay. I know, it's, it's a painful <laughs> thing, but it's true. Um, um, and I happen to believe that you're absolutely right, that, that peritoneal disease is a local regional dissemination rather than metastatic disease, okay. which is best dealt with by surgical quality. Yes. Um, um, I also understand look, all politics are local, and for this reason, it's not so easy to deliver randomized trials, which are essential to spread this out yes. to the wider community. Yeah. Um, what are you doing to address that in terms of um, breaking the back of the resistance to this notion <coughs> through the conduct of proper randomized controlled clinical trials? Well, the, the major activity is uh, in France. At the uh, meeting here, we're going to review uh, all of the current trials that are active. There's seven trials now active around the world testing HIPEC in ovarian cancer. There are five or six, I'm not quite sure, testing it as prevention of peritoneal metastases in T4 and minimal seeding primary colon cancer. There's uh, four trials now around the world in gastric cancer. Uh, the French are actually uh, leading the effort because somehow or other in France, they can say, okay, this is your treatment and there's two options and we're gonna, you know, by the roll of the dice, we're going to uh, uh, give you uh, high tech or not high tech. You can't do that in the United States. People just, uh, they call the hospital president he wants to be famous and he doesn't care about me as a patient. <laughs> so um, the randomized studies in the U.S. Are, are small. We have a randomized study now, Melvin <coughs> versus uh, mitomycin C5FU. But that's about the best uh, randomized study I can do. So there are a lot of studies that are currently active. I think ovary is the most active of the, uh, of the various uh, diseases. I think I probably need to come to your meeting in November. Uh, if you would, uh, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd love to have it. Yes. Any involvement of the peritoneal surface requires that the hormone will be given two centimeters, or if it is neighbor to the cecum, for instance, tumor uh, attached to the peritoneum in the neighbor of the cecum, yeah. or a little bit of the uh, mesentery yeah. in the medial, it necessitates the or mental involvement, all will require the same 
A little bit slow in order, okay. So this is a uh, video that illustrates the... Uh, is it mine? Yes, please. Ah, right, here we go. So uh, this, this is the uh, abdomen open from a xiphoid to pubis, and we have placed traction sutures around the abdominal incision to pull the abdomen up away from the small bowel because the Achilles heel of this uh, procedure is fistula. Fistula start usually with uh, electrosurgical damage to the small bowel, so we're always starting by elevating the uh, anterior abdomen up away from the small bowel for all of these uh, reasons. Now, I also happen to use open technique, so these uh, skin traction sutures uh, are extremely valuable. So you all have been in this situation. You've all done uh, the uh, pseudomyxomas. This is where we...